I mean, this is a detailed conversation that might not be that much about detailing. I'm Ivan. I'm Nick. This is the DIY Detail Podcast. We're going to be talking about the business of detailing. How to improve yourself as a detailing entrepreneur as opposed to as a detailer. And as detailers, we have a passion for making these things shine, for making them clean, for doing all sorts of wonderful things like that. But do we have a passion for customer service? And that's something that a lot of detailers are lacking on. Okay, so talk about that, because I think this is a great conversation for enthusiasts out there who may be in the market for a high-end detailing service. Right. So comment below if you have issues that you've dealt with other small businesses. Do they pick up their phone? How is their customer service? But this is also a podcast geared towards somebody exactly. who's either considering getting into or has already started professionally detailing. Exactly. So if you've started professionally detailing, you need to take your ego out of your head, put it in a little box, store it away on the shelf. A lot of detailers get out of business because they got into the detailing business and their ego fights them the whole way. I have to make this paint perfect. It has to be up to my standards. Meanwhile, the customer just wants a clean, shiny car. And if you've ever had this happen to you, put a comment down below. We know it's happened many times. You go to the detailer, you're enthused about your car. You just bought this car. To you, it's wonderful, it's spectacular, it's perfect. You want it protected. The detailer gets out an inspection light and just tears your car to shreds. Look at this, look at that, look at that. Your manufacturer is no good because they forgot this on the rocker panel or whatever. For detailers, ask your customer what they want, not what you want. You know, it's like going to a steakhouse and saying, I want a porterhouse steak. And they come out and they give you a hamburger. Or they come out and they give you the big cowboy tomahawk. It's not what you ordered. You ordered a porterhouse. Give the customer what they want, not what you want as a detailer. It's an interesting thing for me to witness with Ivan as we detail you know, dozens of vehicles here in the shop in Omaha. It's like, you do over deliver for the people who bring their vehicles here but not in the ways that I used to as a professional, right? right? Like my over delivering was 50 hours of paint correction when I wasn't getting paid for more than like five. Right, and that 50 hours of paint correction, you're actually damaging the paint. So you're, you're stroking your ego, you're making yourself feel better. You're not getting any more for the customer. The customer can't see the difference between five hours and 50 hours of paint correction most of the times. And you've actually removed so much clear coat that now you've damaged their vehicle. Right, but there are so many times where you point things out and I was like, it's so interesting where it's like, it's not done until this is done or you miss this or something like that. So it's like, there are, there are a lot of things that you don't leave behind. It's just, for me, I always thought that if the paint wasn't mirror perfect, yeah. that that was a hack job. Right. And so it's different. There is a very thorough, almost OCD, like everything has to be done mentality from you, but you're not, spending more time than you should on the stuff that isn't important. And I, I, don't, right. I don't know that it's super clear what I just said, but you no, have to kind I, of experience I understand where you're going. It. You so, have to experience it to understand what Ivan's all about. So an example with Nick, he'll polish the paint to perfection, but he won't wipe off, off, the, off all the polish. Or there'll be a high spot in the coating and it's like, ah, that's fine. It isn't. It's things like that, that, that last little touch or you've done the outside of the car, it looks beautiful, you open the door and the door jams look like crap. Uh, Which is not necessarily no, no, anything, it, no, but no. It's, a, it's an example of Yeah, yeah it's yeah. an example. Where you may do something really well, because in your head, in your head, yeah. that's what's most important. Right, exactly. What's most important is what did your customer ask you for? And the other thing that detailers really miss out on is proper customer service. And by proper customer service, it starts with the simple things, like answering your phone. Too many detailers get into that groove, they've got the headsets on, they're rocking to the music, they're polishing the car, and oh, no, I'm in my zone, I'm not gonna answer the phone. Well, guess what? Your customer's gonna keep calling other places till someone actually answers the phone. And when they do, that business gets their business. So it's very important. It's frustrating to want to have your car detailed and no one wants to talk to you. You want to pay someone to detail your car. Yeah. And some people will wait. 
Some but, people will wait, most won't. We're in a, how can I put it? When I was a kid, if I wanted something, it had to go by mail order. So I had to send a letter through the post with a check to company A. Company A would receive that, look at the check, it matches the number, perfect, ship out the product. So if I wanted something really fast, it would take two weeks. Nowadays, you can pick it up the same day most of the time. If you're in a larger center, you can go to an Amazon distribution center and pick it up the same day. Uh, or they'll deliver it to you the next day. Customers now are minded to, I get it when I want it. And also details are a very different thing. It's not like a thing that you can grasp and hold on to. Uh, you know, I want a new set of wheels for my car. That's a new set of wheels. A detail is, to take an expression from Nick, in the moment. They want it now. Their car is dirty now. And today, I feel like I have the budget for a detail. So let's go find a detailer. And one of the things that made my shop so successful is, we were never booked out more than four hours. Not four days, not four weeks, four hours. Meaning that if someone brought us something in the morning, it would be done that afternoon. And if someone brought us something after one o'clock in the afternoon, there's a good chance to get it the same day or at worst, the next morning. But our schedule was such that we could take that vehicle now. And that's something a lot of detailers lose a lot of customers for because they think that being booked out two hours or two weeks, sorry, is a sign of a prosperous business. To me, that's a sign of really poor customer service. So what happens if you feel like the phone starts ringing off the hook? That can be another problem, problem as a detailer, and you're just trying to get the job done that day. Right, so if the phone is ringing off the hook, that is telling you that you need to hire someone to help you. And that's another ego point that dealers, uh, detailers have is, I'm the only one who can do this. No one can ever be as good as me. And if you're an entrepreneur, you would think with a slightly different mindset. That mindset is, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm gonna teach someone to do this part of the business while I learn and in increase my business by doing the other part of the business. As a detailer, you need to fire yourself as a detailer and hire yourself as an entrepreneur. And that's when your detailing business can start to scale. Now, not everyone wants to scale, not everyone wants to have 20, 30, 40, 60 employees. That's not the point. If you're happy with your one car or one bay shop and you're making a great living at it, you're having fun, it's what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with that, that's great. But you still need to manage your customer relations. And yes, the phone, answer it. It doesn't take that long. There exists noise canceling headphones that not only they're noise canceling for you, but the microphone is noise canceling. I used to answer the phone, I had a trucker's headset. I could answer the phone while polishing a car and the person at the other end of the phone wouldn't even know I was polishing a car. I didn't miss a beat, but I didn't miss a customer either. What do you recommend people do out there who are tired, but they don't feel like they could hire somebody? Like the one person operation, you know, it's, uh, it costs money to be able to hire uh, even a kid, right? Yeah, so basically Nick is right and wrong at the same time. It doesn't cost anything to hire anyone if you have the work to have that person there. Because look at it this way. The most you can do is work 40 hours a week. And let's say you charge $100 an hour. So that's $4,000 you can get in a week. But if you have the work for 60 hours, hire someone for that additional 20 hours, you pay them $20 an hour, that gives you a gross margin of $80 an hour. So if you do the math, it's much more profitable for you to hire someone than to let that work go to someone else. What do you think customers out there want? They want their car detailed. Now, not in two weeks, not in two months. Uh, you know, there are some detailing groups online where people brag and they're literally bragging that, hey, I'm booked out four and a half weeks. Isn't that good? No, it's not good. Uh, and another little mistake that detailers make is what I call seesaw marketing. They have no work. They flood Facebook, they flood Google ads, they flood 
anywhere they can to get work. The phone starts ringing, they get a few jobs ahead of them, they stop answering the phone. And then as those jobs dwindle down, they start doing marketing again. They start answering their phone again. They get jobs, they lose it, they go down. They just go up and down, up and down, up and down because they're not providing customer service. As detailers, we're no different than a restaurateur, we're no different than a hair salon. We're a customer service business. The restaurant is feeding hungry people. The, um, the hair salon is taking care of mullets. And as detailers, <laughs> we're taking care of dirty cars. We're, all we're doing is providing a service, just like a restaurant, just like a hair salon, just like anybody else. We're nothing special. We're no different than a mechanic. We're no different than a body shop. We're all doing the same thing. Yes, there's artistry in detailing. There's a lot of good things with detailing. It, it takes skill, but anything takes skill. Uh, you can tell that I'm not the best hairdresser in the world. If you put a pair of scissors in my hand, it's not gonna end well, because I have a skill. My skill is detailing. My skill is not hairdressing. Uh, my skill is not running a factory. So everyone has different skill sets. And if your skill set is detailing in terms of, I can polish paint better than anyone else in the world, but your business is failing, that means you may need to hire an administrator for your business. Hire someone to take care of that portion. If you really like sitting there and polishing paint 24 seven, and I know a lot of people that do, they, just, they live for it, and that's spectacular, then hire someone that can answer the phone and sell the jobs. Well, what if they don't know anything about detailing? How do you get them to understand the terminology and the jobs the way that you do? It takes a week's worth of training. It's not a big deal. So get out of the mindset. This is another mindset a lot of small business owners have, not just detailers, but a lot of small business owners, especially when they started their small business from nothing. I'm not going to teach someone how to take my business away from me. For me, my employees were better detailers than I was because I taught them how to be a better detailer. I taught them how to do their job to a, such a high level that they were efficient, they had spectacular quality, and we had no comebacks because they didn't miss anything because as an entrepreneur, I had very solid standard operating procedures in, in place that the employees didn't have to think as they were working. And taking that thinking out of it makes it go so much better. For them, they could close their eyes, start at the front of the car, not open their eyes till they reached the back, and they hadn't missed a spot on the car because they knew exactly the motions they had to do. Every aspect of what they had to do was laid out, was programmed, and it was easy for them. But they got the joy of detailing. And joy, the joy of detailing, if you haven't detailed a car, if you haven't polished a car, or even washed a dirty car, you get that instantaneous rush of, look what I did. Yeah. You know, detailing shouldn't take 12, 24, 72 hours. It, it's almost instant gratification. And as a career, as something to do, that instant gratification is fun. And the other thing is, you're not doing the same thing day in, day out. Yes, we had standard operating procedures that told them you start washing here and you finish there. That's fine but every vehicle they washed was different. So the method of doing it remains the same, but you're doing it on different surfaces. You're doing it on different cars. One day you could have a Chevette. The other day you could have a, a Corvette. Or you, know, you could have a Ford, the next day a Ferrari. So basically you have that variety. You have that instant gratification. You know, one of my favorite jobs to do is a wash clay and seal. So we wash it, we decontaminate with the synthetic decontamination towel, and we throw, or not we throw, but we use uh, ceramic gloss as the lubricant along with the rinse -less wash. It's a very fast process. And in our, our shops, it was the most popular service we offered. Now as detailers, everyone wants to do paint correction. I wanna do paint correction, I wanna do paint correction. Many customers don't want a, and B, don't need paint correction. They think their car is perfect the way it is. It's just a little dirty. As detailers, we see things that no one else sees. We have this vision impairment that allows us to see stuff <laughs> that nobody else sees. 
Nick, myself, we stop at a stoplight. We see a white car that needs iron remover, we see a red car that needs to be polished, and we see a black car with polishing squirrels on it. Everybody else sees a white Volkswagen, a black Land Rover, and a red Ford. That's what they see. Yeah. We see it needs this, it needs that, it needs that. So as detailers, the first question you need to ask your customer politely when they're coming is, why are you here? Find out why your customer wants their vehicle detailed. It may be a completely different mindset than what you have. And knowing the why allows you to better serve them. When you're sitting down at a restaurant, they know automatically why you're there. You're hungry, mm. right? But they still give you a menu because you might want soup. I might want a sandwich. Everybody wants something different. And you could have the best soup in the world, and if I don't like soups, it doesn't matter. And if, some, if the chef puts a soup down in front of me, I'm still not gonna eat it. Now, don't worry, I like soup. But just using that as an example. So as a detailer, we're gonna do a three-stage cut and buff, we're gonna wet sand your car, we're gonna make the paint perfect. And then the customer next week, yeah, I'm still going through the drive-through car wash. Yeah. As a detailer, that doesn't make you feel good. I think coming to grips too as a detailer in your own heart and yeah. soul of seeing paint with scratches and swirls, but also seeing it shiny yeah. and understanding the beauty of that in certain settings, right? Right. Preserving clear coat is a really important thing that we talk about a lot. So yeah. if you can get a vehicle that is still swirled and scratched, glossier, shinier, and protected, yeah. and understand that most people see a shiny car, yes. and not get in your ego about the fact that it's not good enough, Right. There, there is a beauty in that if the customer wants that service. Yeah, and you know, we look at this vehicle here, unless your last name is Land Rover, your name's not on the car. The second they drive out of your driveway, it's none of your business anymore. You've detailed it, yes, great. You did a great job. I've never had a customer take a car that I detailed to the detail shop down the street and analyze my detail. It's never happened. And as a shop owner, I've never had a customer come to me and say, would you look at this detail? I just paid for this detail. Is it good? No. As long as I'm satisfying my customer, they're not gonna go looking elsewhere. So satisfy your customers. But if you promised your customer, this paint is gonna be perfect and they see a flaw, then you have a problem. But if you promise the customer, I'm gonna make your paint better, I'm gonna preserve as much clear coat as I can while giving you gloss and shine. They're happy with that. And to Nick's point, like, we, like I said, we see things that nobody else sees. Most people look at their car from five feet away. They're not looking at it with an inspection light in a dark room going, oh, look at that. They'll never see that. Uh, we polished a car the other day here. I noticed right away that it had been repainted. Nick didn't. I've owned a body shop I see defects that even Nick doesn't see. I see scratches that sometimes he doesn't necessarily yeah. say he doesn't see, but like, to me, I, I'm like, did he miss that or whatever? And I'll see it, but I don't see the texture and the nibs and the runs and yeah. the undulations in the paint that a body shop guy has seen. And that's yeah, exactly. really humbling for me because I thought I was the Hawkeye. But, but what is that about your experience owning a body shop that helps you see, well, like, like you just have to have the experience to see yeah. these things. So, Myself, I don't look at the surface, I look at the paint. A customer and yourself, you're looking at the surface. So you're looking at the clear coat. I'm looking beyond the clear coat. I'm looking at the texture, like he said. Uh, the hood on the one vehicle, you could see sanding marks all over the place. You put it outside, not under these lights, it was great. Well, I saw it was a very cloudy hood. Yeah. The, the paint, I saw cloudy paint and hazy, and I knew it didn't have clarity to it but I didn't know why Right. initially. Exactly, but then when we polished it, now we had the surface clear from removing that oxidation, and it was very clear to see there was a primer spot there. There's uh, pigtails there from a DA sander. I saw that. I was yeah. wondering if something was a water spot, and you said it wasn't. You said no. it was? Uh, just, well, that, that one was a, basically, they, when they applied the primer, they probably heated the primer to get it to cure faster, it forms a crust, but there's still solvent trapped. 
So they paint over it, it looks good because they sand it, etc. Eventually that solvent works its way out and then you have what's called pullback. This is wild, the stuff this guy knows. And every time I think that you're wrong, you're usually right. Sometimes. But, but it looked like scarring from a yeah, water exactly. to me, right? And I'm, I have a pretty trade eye. Like, yeah, exactly. I've done this right. for years and years, right? Like, but, and I looked at it, I was like, Ivan, there's just some etching from water spots here. And you said, nope. And, I, and then we had that conversation. And, it was and like, then when you look at it with the light at a different angle and everything, you can see that the surface itself is perfectly flat. So the clear coat had no scarring in it. That scarring was actually in the primer, and you could see it through the clear coat into the base on the base coat that looked like a, it did look like a water spot. But in reality, if you look across the paint, just at the very very surface, there was no marring or nothing there. There was no no scar there. The scar was underneath it. So what is the person out there listening supposed to take away from all? Are they supposed to get real intimidated and say, "Wow, well, no. I, I could never know anything. Let's just give up. I don't know paint that way." No, or, exactly. And you don't need to. Basically. If you're wanting to start detailing as a business, or if you own a detailing business, take your ego, put it in a box, put it on a shelf, and forget about it. Work for your customer. Work to your customer's expectations, to your customer's need. In detailing, the hardest expectation to manage is not the customers, it's the detailers. Amen to that. We hope this has been a podcast that you found value from. If you did find value from it, we have another podcast that is specifically geared towards somebody who's thinking about turning pro. Right. So you're thinking about turning pro, you're an enthusiast, what do you need to know? Uh, similar to this, but with kind of a different take. If you enjoyed this one, check that one out if you're watching on YouTube and click right here. Mm -hmm.